Oh, hello, uh, everyone. This is Tommy Tan, and I'm currently Director of Computational Biology at the Biotech Startup in Boston area. So I'm really excited uh, to work with Koshubo today to answer some of the questions from the audience. Um, hi everyone, I'm Kushbu uh, and I work as a bioinformatics scientist uh, over five years now and um, I create YouTube um, content on uh, bioinformatics and um, today we decided to do a joint question and answer collaboration video with Tommy. So thank you so much Tommy for agreeing to do this um, and bringing in your um, insights from a very impressive um, bioinformatics journey. So um, we did put up a post a couple of weeks ago asking questions from our um, viewers as well as people who follow us on LinkedIn and those who are um, hoping to get started in bioinformatics and are interested in bioinformatics to post us questions or send us questions. Um, so we did compile, we get, did get a lot of questions and we are really grateful for to everyone who sent us questions. So. Uh, we compiled those questions and um, we tried to pick out those which were um, more generalized and we thought would be helpful to a larger audience uh, as opposed to those which are very project specific or very context specific. So we would be skipping those. But I think we are uh, answering a lot of those questions. There were only a few that were like, very specific, which we would not be answering. Um, so we can just start with um, going over those questions and start a discussion on that. Oh, sounds fantastic. By the way, it's all like freestyles. <laughs> yes, uh, we did not create any script or we did not rehearse. So this is going to be <laughs> an open discussion. And this is uh, this is what both of us, I think, prefer to have like an open conversation on um, these questions. And some of the questions are like really interesting. So, yep. Okay, so the first question that we got was, um, this person is in high school senior. So this person said, I'm a high school senior and I'm about to start university this year. Uh, I wanted to ask question about bioinformatics and genomics. I wanted to know that, is it possible to start bioinformatics or genomics after doing a bachelor's in software engineering? Um, is there a career path possible like this? Okay. What do you answer. want to <laughs> okay, uh, I think the short answer is yes, uh, because uh, bioinformatics, the name itself suggests that it's, it's coming from majorly two domains, biology and um, the informatics part, which is the computational side. So if you have a degree in computational, you can, you can get into bioinformatics. The only thing is that you will have to gather some understanding of the biological side of it. And it applies the vice versa. Uh, if you're coming from biological side, you can get into bioinformatics, but you have to gain understanding on the computation side. Right. So if you are in a software engineer, so you must be really good at programming. So and programming is a prerequisite for bioinformatics. So either in Python or R, of course, you also need to be really good at Unix commands. Mm -hmm. uh, as Krishnapur said, so if you want to get into bioinformatics, you need to understand biology. So you need to take some courses from for biology and understand um, uh, the biology. Because most of the time, I would say in my experience, actually uh, asking the right biological question is more difficult. Programming itself actually is not that hard. And not, of course, like bio, bioinformatics has its own like nuances, like it has many different databases specific to biology. You also need to be familiar with those things and what kind of um, public available data repository are available, things like that. No, I totally agree. Um, so asking the right biological question is the foundation uh, of bioinformatics because once you know what you're answering, like what question what question you're asking and what answer you're looking for, I think that is um, the, the starting point for any um, bio, uh, bioinformatics analysis. Um, so yeah, the answer is yes. And um, all of that that we just discussed. Okay, um, moving on to the next question. So next question, there are essentially two questions which we combined because those follow similar themes. So I'll read out both those questions and we'll answer, like we'll talk about and discuss those, um, the pointers that we think will be the answer. So um, the first question is, what is the appropriate path and roadmap to learning bioinformatics from scratch? for both backgrounds, um, biology and computer science or engineering. What I mean by bioinformatics can include computational biology, data analysis, tools development, structural biology, et cetera. 
The second question in this category is, what are the roadmaps of computational biology and key points we should consider as beginners learning in this field? Okay. Uh, I think both of us have created videos on this, <laughs> on our respective channels. Um, and I think a lot of it would be redundant, uh, saying the similar things that I think uh, for to get started with bioinformatics, with depending, it heavily depends on what background you're bringing, but uh, mainly learning programming, as you said previously, getting um, a good uh, grasp of computational skills, which is programming and understanding Linux and Linux, uh, working in a Linux system. Also gaining understanding on um, different omics types, uh, because we work with a lot of different kinds of um, uh, high throughput data. So understanding how, what, what information each omics data, data can give us and how to process them, each, the nuances, like how to process them, the, you know, the, the technical nitty gritty that we have to consider. And, uh, and I think this is something that we discussed a lot last time that reading literature to understand the concept, like what's probably going on in that particular area that you're trying to study and Please feel free to inter like add your points because no, I'm just. No, no, no go I'm, ahead. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll try me. <laughs> I'm just adding what's coming to my mind. Yeah, yeah. And um, this this is a given. The last point that I wanted to say is kind of a given. But um, if someone's looking to start in bioinformatics, I think the biggest uh, point would be to enroll in a formal degree, um, get a formal education in biology. Like it could be a graduate or an undergraduate program. Or, and if one already has that and one wants to enhance their skill, probably getting involved in online courses and working on open source projects or bioinformatics training projects. And you post a lot of um, coding exercises and opportunities to get involved. So I think getting involved and getting hands dirty on doing these um, analysis. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. So um, practical uh, like exercise is very important for you to learn. Um, Bioinformatics, or essentially for you to learn anything. Uh, but before you, when we dive into like how how we actually learn bioinformatics, like I want to emphasize that bioinformatics is a very big, broad like domain. It, and people say the same thing bioinformatics, but they may mean very different things. <laughs> so, for example, uh, bio, what's the difference between bioinformatics versus the computational biology? And Initially, what I thought, like my opinion is, okay, bioinformatics is more like algorithm development and then develop a tool and computational biology is more, more about data analysis and derive a biological insight. It turns out actually some people have the exactly opposite actual opinion. So it totally experienced a, a bias. So it's really <laughs> biased towards your uh, own experience. So we really use those terms uh, interchangeably, but in terms of bioinformatics, like it, it could be like develop an algorithm. So you need to have really solid mathematical or programming skills. But if you just do data analysis, you really need to uh, uh, have really strong analytical skills like uh, data wrangling, data reshaping, and the data visualization. And, and of course, like important uh, like bio biological uh, background also. Uh, and if I started like again, had to learn, I would start just to replicate uh, figures from a genomics paper, as Kushbo said. So read the paper, what kind of uh, biological question the paper is trying to answer, and then what kind of data uh, is able to answer those those questions. And then you try to rep replicate all, all different uh, uh, figures. And of course, there are uh, also different data types, as Kushbo said, that maybe it's whole genome sequencing, it's a uh, chip sequencing, or even RNA sequencing. So you also need to learn how to actually pre-process those data uh, on the units command uh, uh, environment, and then do all the downstream analysis using either Python or R and then make uh, good figures, visualizations, yeah. That's, that's actually a good point about recreating um, the figures in the paper. Um, and again, with a lot of times people do reach out and say that, okay, I want to learn all these, like want to learn how to deal with all these different kinds of omics. But I also feel that when you're starting out, it, I think it's better to understand 
completely how working with one or a two like a couple of omic types like how do you what insights those generate like how do you process them from end to end what do mm -hmm. the what mm -hmm. the tools do uh, what information can you gain out of that and when is the time that you that such kind of omics data sets can help you i think once you because again as you said it's biology it's like an umbrella term it's a whole universe uh, so i think it's starting with a couple of things getting your understanding more clear getting a grasp on programming tools getting used to the linux system and then scaling up yeah. to different steps i think that would be a more strategic approach in understanding um and learning how to uh, deal with these omics data sets and how to process them yeah exactly so build a solid foundation first exactly. like in terms of skills like unix commands python and r programming then focus on one data type. For example, I, my own example is I started to learn how to analyze chip sequencing data. It's just one of the data types. And then once you understand the whole process, okay, uh, starting point is fast queue files, then use tools that get to align them, then you call peaks, and then you ev eventually get a whatever a count metrics, even uh, if you want to do differential peak uh, analysis. And then it's very natural for you to extend to a different data type, for example, honey sequencing data. Okay, also start from FASTQ files, then you also align them. But now instead of align to the genome, now you align to the transcriptome. And they eventually also get a uh, exactly. count, count, count matrix. So, so for genes or instead of peaks. So, yeah. yeah. And once you have the chip seek, then you understand ATAC, then you maybe understand high C, and then mm -hmm. you go on from there. So yeah, I think that's a very good point. And coincidentally, I also started with chip seek. So <laughs> that was again also my first uh, data type that I ever dealt with as a bad nutrition. Yep. So great. I think we had some great pointers for these questions. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the next set of questions. Again, the next set of questions, um, there are three questions that we've grouped together. And um, so the first question is, how can one who is bioinformatics undergrad, who uh, has a bio background in biology, but not necessary an in-depth understanding of cancer biology, get started with cancer research using bioinformatics method? Mm -hmm. um, that's the first question. The second question is, what are the best sources of finding large data sets for real life practices and maybe even to make new discoveries? And the third question is, tell us the main keys for designing a methodology and finding ideas for future research based on your experience. And I think the reason we club these three questions and the simple answer is to do a literature review. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to read papers <laughs> for all of them. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, with bioinformatics, a lot of people do not realize, but... Uh, the the best way to get to know the current trends get to um, work on the data sets like get access to like publicly available data sets and even get ideas on developing a strategy is to do a literature research yeah i agree with that so, <laughs> so for example if you have biology uh, background but you don't have cancer biology background of course you need to understand some of the cancer biology but also read those cancer genomics paper, right? Like what kind of data type they have. For example, like in the early days, like people will carry out whole exon sequencing or whole genome sequencing to look at mutation profiles like, of those different uh, cancer cancer types. And then you can even subtype of the same cancer type into different subtypes based on mutation profiles. So you just look at those papers. Mm -hmm. Okay, what kind of uh, studies they're doing and what kind of methodology they're using? Um, then you try to actually uh, replicate them. Another, um, I totally agree with that. And it's also interesting when you say about like looking at these mutation data, a lot of times you also get to know about um, the rationale behind choosing certain filters when you're looking for, and why is it applicable to that particular cancer? So every cancer is like, when again, when we're talking about cancer, it's again, mm -hmm. the whole year. So are we talking about adult cancers? Are we talking about pediatric cancers? And Every cancer has a different um, clinical pathological features. There are different things that we look at in each of the cancers. So even if you gain expertise in one particular type of cancer, you would still have to do a literature review if you're switching or if you are processing a data that is a different cancer type. Yeah. Um, so I think, and this is personally like, I 
benefit a lot from uh, do like reading up papers because that is one of the best sources that's particularly addressing the second question about finding large data sets. So we do have portals like GDC, NCBI, GEO, P, uh, PC Bio Portal, C Bio Portal, all of those. But I think the best place to find data sets are like the research papers, because that's again, that again gives you the backstory of why such a data set was created. What was the whole idea, the study design? So yeah, I think um, doing a literature, there's there's no other, there's no two ways about it, I guess. Right, right. So in terms of finding paper or data, uh, mm -hmm. they are like large, you know, those consortium projects, they're generating those data, but eventually they will publish them. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. the TCGA and then you read the paper, okay, there's this data sets from the Cancer Genome Atlas and you'll go and, and play, download the data and play with them, yeah. That's um uh, that sounds good. Um uh, and sorry, just just because we're talking on the cancer um, research biology, like a quick short story. So before I started working, so currently the the uh, the position that I'm working at focuses on a particular type of pediatric cancer. So before I got hired into the position, I had no experience working with cancer biology. And one of the recruiters, when I was talking to that person, that person made a very good point about why you why cancer biology is not like particularly taught in as curriculum in schools is because it's so dynamic that every day there are things changing and every day there are new discoveries that they cannot come up with a curriculum that's that 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 would be the most updated or up-to-date curriculum to be taught to students and that's one of the reason why there are such few cancer associates, like you can have electives or uh, additional courses, but there would never be like a core course in any um, school that would teach you like a can like cancer genomics or cancer biology. Uh, so anyway, uh, moving on to the next questions. So uh, the next, there are two questions that we combined here. So the first is recommendations for tools or software for organizing workflows, code or files. And the second question is, when we have multiple projects at the same time, what is the best strategy to organize myself? Okay. So I think uh, when we were discussing these questions, we talked about how it's in the importance of documentation. Uh, whenever you're doing the project, uh, having a readme, um, a definite structure, uh, a folder structure. And you also link, like provided me a good paper about how to organized computational biology projects, which we will be adding the link to that paper in the description section of this video. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think the the importance of documentation is very understated um, for, and how important it is um, for computational biology. Yeah, for me, I'm a big fan of a reproducible research and I would love to actually document every step that I, that I did. And will save the future you from a lot of headache. So if you do a lot of documentation, it, it seems like a lot of work, but it will worth it. So eventually. So as Krishna said, so for computational projects, usually you should have a consistent folder structure for each project. For usually each uh, each project will be its uh, of its own folder, but within that folder you should have a consistent folder structure. For example, you have the scripts folder and you have the data folder, you have the results folder, usually that's what you have. Or maybe you have some uh, source of folder like which you make all those functions or executables there. But the idea is that you put all your data in the data folder and make them unchangeable using Linux command. And then you uh, you open a script in the scripts folder and then you run the scripts. So the scripts will read the data in the data folder and spits out the results in or figures or tables in the results folder. So in this case, you can always actually reproduce what you have. And uh, also uh, the code need to be version controlled and pushed to GitHub. So you have another backup copy there. Yeah, that makes definite sense. And uh, I think another thing that you mentioned the last time we were talking about this, and I really like that, and I have used that previously as well as to number your scripts whenever you have like multiple steps to have, okay, this is the first script and let's say we're doing fast QC and the second step is we are doing um, post uh, like, like alignment and then mm -hmm. we are doing post alignment QC. Like you have numbered the steps. So maybe let's say you revisit your scripts like five years down the line. And this happens to like us all the time that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the 
the way that I was telling you that time that I had to go back to like a script in 2019 that I had written in 2019 and I have no recollection of what the script does but because there is a documentation just like how you mentioned or whether there, there are like these steps you it's easier for you to go back make changes and read on the script and re reproduce the results um that you originally created yeah exactly so what Kushbo said is so you can if you have multiple steps you can name your scripts like like the zero one then underscore then the name of the scripts then zero two underscore so when you sort the files it will sort like numerically so you know one two three four five so you know the the, the, the steps the sequences of all those uh, scripts and of course and you this if you have this full structure it will make your data uh, analysis data analysis more reproducible of course, eventually, if you also want to uh, <laughs> reproduce the same computing environment, then you, you need to have a little bit more advanced skills like Docker container, like all the stuff to, to containerize all the computing environment. So you can definitely reproduce what you had several years ago. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in case if we don't have the numbering, like if it's just like a one or a two standalone scripts, I usually like make notes at the beginning of the scripts, like just add comments at what the script does. Because a lot of times the naming, I, I give it ambiguous names and I, like after a few years down the line, I don't even remember what the script does. And just the small description of how I understand just makes me re like, reminds me that, okay, the script is meant for this and it's supposed to do this. Yeah. So yes, documentation and folder structure is how you handle multiple projects and organize your code. 